Awesome. <laughs> I can't dance, actually. You would think from that introduction, which was very kind, by the way, thank you, that I'd be give presenting my PhD dissertation or something like that here. But the fact of the matter is we're talking about quick and easy TensorFlow with Anaconda Enterprise 5. I mean, we have a lot of people asking us, you know, is TensorFlow compatible with Anaconda Enterprise 5? And my first draft of the talk uh, was, yes, yeah, you can install it on An Anaconda Enterprise 5, and that's the end of the talk, and we can go have our coffee and, and wrap it up. But I realized when they, talked, when they asked me to do quick and easy, they wanted some evidence that it was quick and easy for users, not for me, the speaker. So I needed to put a few more slides together for you. Um, nevertheless, our focus is really not going to be on doing a deep dive into deep learning or, or how to solve this particular modeling problem, but really, literally, how easy it is for Anaconda Enterprise and TensorFlow to work together. Because if you want to build a modeling platform using Anaconda Enterprise, TensorFlow is going to be one of the options you, you're probably going to want to consider. Um, a little bit more about me. I'm a computational mathematician by training. Um, I've been at Anaconda for about three years. And before that, I did a lot of different things. Uh, immediately before that, I was doing solo consulting. Um, and I've done a couple startups, I've taught a few courses, just kind of been all over the place. Um, I'm now the director of technical consulting in Anaconda. So what that means is that if you purchase the platform, or for that matter, if you're an Anaconda distribution user and you need assistance implementing your business critical solutions, um, I'm hoping that you're coming to us to talk to us. And so if after this talk you'd like to talk more about how we can help you uh, take Anaconda into production, then uh, please come find me. Um, and that's not really my chicken. It turns out I, I rent, this is my Gravatar, and I thought it'd be cool to show. And we'll play with this image in a little bit. But uh, I, rented a, I rented a petting zoo for my neighborhood block party once. And I, I mean, that, that chicken just was too interested in my glasses. So it became my permanent Gravatar. All right, so executive summary. Like I said, I, I, first it was just one slide long. TensorFlow and Anaconda work well together. We can go home. But there's a little bit more than that, obviously. One of the reasons, of course, is Conda, our... our environment and package management system, which really simplifies the installation and deployment of any packages, but TensorFlow in particular, which is a bit of a complex uh, you know, package, no surprise. Um, and Anaconda Enterprise enables cloud, a collaborative cloud or cluster-based model development, and so TensorFlow is a great candidate for use on the platform. Another reason why Anaconda Enterprise is a good candidate is because it, pr it, allow it provides one-click deployments of notebooks or dashboards custom web applications, REST APIs. And, um, and then one other note that seems kind of out of place in this list, uh, one thing I wanted to make it clear, if you're new to TensorFlow, raise your hand if you haven't really used TensorFlow yourself yet, OK? Um, great, That's, uh, this, is, this is fantastic. One thing I want to encourage you to do is not get overwhelmed by how the, fe the rich feature set of TensorFlow. Feel free to stick with your existing data pipelines and other, you know, and other techniques. You don't have to adopt TensorFlow wholesale. You can pick and choose in sort of an a la carte fashion. And I've got a demo at the end of this talk that just kind of shows you what I mean in a very light way. So uh, I, it's great to see a lot of hands. I'm actually so kind of a novice on TensorFlow as well. I see a few people in this room that I know are absolute experts in deep learning and in TensorFlow in particular. Um, and but. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, I think we're going to have a good conversation. Uh, by the TensorFlow's own website says, doesn't say anything immediately about machine learning. It says that it's an open source library for high performance numerical computation. And it, of course, it's primarily used in machine learning and AI applications. But I think that that description is apt because one of TensorFlow's real strengths is the power of its lower level computational capabilities. And the name actually captures the, some of the key aspects of that. The term tensor refers to uh, its n-dimensional array computation capabilities. The, the term flow refers to its paradigm of building computations in the form of data flow graphs. So, when the the, so you, you communicate the structure of the computations that you need to perform, whether that's the execution of a deep learning model or a generalized linear model or any other, sor any other machine learning application on TensorFlow. You've communicated to the underlying comp compute engine the calculations in the form of a data flow graph. And as a result, that helps TensorFlow facilitate things like uh, distributed computation or GPU acceleration or even the recent, with the recent release of their tensor processing units, the ability to leverage those in your ca computations as well. Um, in fact, that low-level work is so, uh, you know, is, is, is both a blessing and a curse. Some people complain that, it's, that TensorFlow is a little too low-level and they might prefer a deep learning library like Keras. Well, I think, the, the, you know, to TensorFlow's credit, 
they recognize the value of a higher level API like Keras, and now Keras is becoming the de facto, if not the actual standard uh, for building neural networks, deep learning networks in TensorFlow. Um, one of my favorite pieces, especially when it comes to doing a talk or a demonstration of TensorFlow, is TensorBoard. It's a separate package in, in the TensorFlow ecosystem that helps you visualize your TensorFlow compute graph, view plots of training data, uh, training progress and errors and accuracy and other model-specific uh, data. And we, it's deployable, as, as we will see, uh, as an Anaconda Enterprise web app. So it's a great way for you to interact with your model, especially if you've been doing hyperparameter searches, which means that you've been solving a family of models that you can compare and pick out the best one. It's a great way to compare relative performance and decide uh, which set of parameters is appropriate for your model. Um, and, the reason, and the reason why, uh, I would say the, the linchpin, as, as for why uh, the anac Anaconda makes TensorFlow easier for you to use, to install, to deploy, is the Conda package management system, which is both something you can use standalone as part of the Anaconda distribution on your laptops, as well as it's a fundamental component of the Anaconda enterprise platform as well. Um, it, we, the, the Anaconda distribution team, the same team that's built your Python and NumPy and SciPy packages, is also building TensorFlow for you. They're building both CPU and GPU versions of TensorFlow. So if you have a, GP, you know, a good, powerful GPU for accelerated computation, you can leverage that with the TensorFlow GPU package. Um, Conda ensures that it installs all of TensorFlow's dependencies for you and that anything else that you've installed in your environment is compatible with TensorFlow. Um, and so you can, you can install, whether it's Jupyter Notebooks or Jupyter Lab or any other development tools that you need, you can combine them together in a single environment. And because Conda supports the idea of multiple isolated compute environments, you can easily build a TensorFlow environment for specifically for using for building TensorFlow models without worrying that you might be corrupting other packages or other environments and other projects that might not be using TensorFlow. And that's a, a huge for me because I work on multiple projects and I want to make sure that each of my environments is separated and has only the tools that I need for the job. And when you install TensorFlow with Anaconda, when using the Conda Package Manager or using Navigator or Anaconda Enterprise, you're going to get TensorBoard, TensorBoard automatically installed alongside it. So you don't even have to think about how to get that working as well. Now, Anaconda Enterprise in particular, um, you probably already heard some introductions to Anaconda Enterprise, but just to highlight some of the key features as it relates to this, it's a, it's a collaborative data science platform for Python and R that you can deploy in your private data center um, or on your favorite cloud providers. Um, uh, one particular application is if you want to do machine learning on very sensitive data, you can bring the compute platform to the cluster where the data lives instead of risking that your employees are downloading that data to their laptops and taking it to the coffee shop. All right? um, the enterprise also allows you to do one-click deployment of notebooks and dashboards and REST APIs. And yes, you can use, and, and, and developers worry about this when they're asked to be play in a you know, data you know, science sandbox, you can use all of your favorite Anaconda packages on the platform. And a particular note that I wanted to make sure to add, uh, particularly since it's something that TensorFlow can make good use of, uh, support for GPU acceleration is coming on the platform on AE5 with version 5.2, which is coming out this quarter. It's on the roadmap for this quarter. All right, so how do I get started using TensorFlow on the Anaconda Enterprise platform? There are several ways to do that. The simple, obviously, I can create a brand new project and just make sure that TensorFlow is included in the package list, or I can add it to an existing project. If I'm working on an Anaconda project archive, uh, which, is, which is a way to archive your uh, code assets, your data assets, and other, you know, and, and, and other project-specific assets in a single archive, you can upload that to the Anaconda Enterprise and then continue your work on the platform. And if it already has TensorFlow as a dependency, that dependency will be honored on the Enterprise platform as well. Um, or a, a, an easy way for you to get started, especially uh, if you use the Anaconda test drive, which I'm going to talk about at the end of this talk, um, you can copy and modify one of our TensorFlow-enabled demo projects and just pull it up and start working with it. So I, I am going to do some live demo here, but I took a few screenshots just for, for a couple reasons, just in case Wi-Fi went haywire on me, but also so that we can, uh, just to save some of the, uh, you know, save some of the back and forth. But this is a screenshot of the home, my home page on my personal Anaconda Enterprise instance. Um, and I've highlighted here that I can, I've got 
the ability to create a new project. I can upload an existing project, again, as I talked about before. Um, and when I do that, uh, let's say I'm, I'm in one of my existing projects. This is the uh, Jupyter Lab view of, of, a, of a model project that I've put together actually for my model management talk tomorrow. And if I go into the, into the package tab, I can easily add TensorFlow as one of the packages to this project. Um, and as you can see, I've, it, it does autocomplete. So I started typing TensorFlow, and now I can see all the packages that are available to me that have, that match. Um, and then I can select either the latest version or a specific version of TensorFlow. I can, if I need to pin to a specific version, I can do that here. Um, and then once I save my changes, uh, and the, the platform will automatically add TensorFlow to my environments, and then I can start using it in my projects. So let's take a look here. I'm going to do a live demo. Um, I've just, uh, oh, no, actually, yeah, let's see what I got. You know, when I take that back, let me go back to this, and then we're going to get back to the live demo. Um, the next step, actually, is looking at sample projects. Like I said, one of the easiest ways to get started is to use one of the, you know, is to make a copy of one of the sample projects on the platform. We've got three. There are two image classifier projects that both use the same machine learning model. It's the inception model that Google built for the ImageNet database, as well as uh, a TensorBoard example that, used, that does a digit recognition modeling um, problem uh, and that, lever that uses TensorBoard. So that's a great uh, sample to choose if you want to use TensorBoard. And so that's what I'd like to look at now. We're going we're gonna to take a look at the image classifier demo. Um, it uses the pre-built, again, it's a pre-built TensorFlow model. And, it, and we put a simple Tornado web front end on it. Um, and you can also use Flask. And that's why there's two different uh, sample projects on there. So let's cut over to it. Um, so this is actually the project development window that we would see with, ten, uh, with it. Um, and for example, I can, look at the si I can look at the code. Oh, I need to refresh that. That's what I get for starting it up earlier so that I could save myself some time. All right, so I pull, I can, this is the actual code from the original image classifier project. Um, and what I can do is I can um, actually, I can start up a window. Okay, and so then I, oh, let me show you. First of all, I'm gonna have it, from the command line, I'm gonna have it classify this image right here. Okay, so does anybody know what this is? It's not a quiz. All right, good, it's Giant Panda. Well, let's see if, if Inception knows the same, the same thing I do. You know, I just realized that thanks to my benign dreamer, it's not necessarily a good idea for me to type live on a stage, but we're gonna make it work. All right, wait just a little bit. Cross my fingers. Okay, good, TensorFlow is running. And boom, it thinks so with 93% confidence that it's a giant panda and uh, everything else significantly less than that. So that's great. Um, so it works, that's a good sign. Now I talked about deployment. So if I go over to the main project page and I can deploy a project. So I'm not gonna do this because I've already deployed it and I'm gonna show you in just a second. But I can actually select any, any of the tagged revisions of this project that I want so I can actually go back in history. If, uh, this is great for model management purposes, by the way. If I wanna go back and recover an old model to do some post-mortem analysis, I can go back and look at a different tagged revision of a project. Um, and then I can hit deploy. And when I hit deploy, um, I'm gonna take into something like this. So I might have to refresh this for the same reason I did before. Okay, now this, this has, the uh, Anaconda Enterprise kind of dressing around it, but it can easily eliminate that. So again, a really simple web application. So then let's select a file from my local desktop. And let's see, where is that? Desktop, I'm gonna do this one right there. That looks familiar. Okay, and then let's hit button and see what it says. Try one more time. Ah, there we go. Sorry, I just wasn't patient enough. Okay, so I was actually really impressed with this at first because it obviously ignored the very charismatic individual in the foreground and, and managed to find the hen perched on my shoulder. But I was also a little put off that it didn't classify me. And so I, so I wanted to, to do a different image. 
And uh, so I picked this one here. This was my old uh, headshot back in the continuum days. So let's put that on there. I guess the Wi-Fi makes it a little bit slower, but we can be patient enough. But again, this, the important thing to note is that this is a deployed application. It's using TensorFlow. This is something that you can make available. Um, oh, shoot. Let's do that again. I should have made a screenshot of that one. Just in case this doesn't work, by the way, I, uh, it doesn't know how to recognize me. That's the, that's the, uh, anyway. well, that's embarrassing, but we can move on. We will persist, right? Um, and so anyway, so the point is that this is a good example of copying a sample project from our samples, opening it up, deploying it as an application and using it. And so it's a pretty easy way to get started with TensorFlow. Um, oh, did I? Oh, shoot. I didn't uh, save the uh, screenshot of the botched classification effort. All right, so then my second demo here is, is the MNIST uh, TensorBoard uh, sample application. So this is a digit recognition uh, project using the popular MNIST data set. We're building a family of deep learning models and training them on the data set and comparing their performance. And we're using TensorBoard as a web app to explore the results, OK? And so um, in this case, I want to go to the uh, application page. And so I what I want to do is I want to look at the project. And if I open up the command, um, I can see that it's, oh, no, that's my wide and deep uh, model there. There it is. I go to project, open that up. And look at the command, and it's you know this is a deployable web app. Now, of course, it just says it's running you know a script. But if I go to the files and take a look at the script, it's actually pretty simple. Um, it's oh shoot, I opened this up way too early this morning. Okay, there we go. Uh, all I'm all that script is ultimately doing is running TensorBoard directly, and the only thing that it has to do special in order to work well with Anaconda Enterprise is that you set the port uh, to 8086. Although it will, it will set the port, it'll pass the correct port number in for you. And so uh, all you have to do is pass that in turn to your underlying app, whether it's TensorBoard or any other web application. And then it will proxy that um, to the right address when you're using Anaconda Enterprise. All right. So then if we go take a look at that over here, let's go ahead and just to throw caution to the wind, let's refresh. Again, I'll turn off the window dressing. And so this is a great, uh, this is TensorBoard. Th again, as, as I said, that this particular project, we're training multiple models with different configurations to do digit recognition, right? And so we can see if we scroll over here, we can look at the error message. There is a clear winner, um, and we can't see it at the bottom of the screen, unfortunately, just because this, uh, the window is too small. But this one is a, you know, it's obviously significantly better than the others. So that's a nice way to take a look and, and immediately, you know, study the, the uh, the various outputs of your model. And then we have um, an entropy measure as well. Entropy, you know, the lo lower entropy is a good sign as well. And so again, the same model uh, does better, uh, does the best in this case. Okay, I can expand that. I can look at either, this one is actually better for, uh, I can do logarithmic or linear scaling. This is one of my favorite uh, screens here. Let's pull this up. <coughs> So this, what this is, 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 is a visualization of the manifold or the surface of all of the digits in, um, that, it's, that it's recognized. Now, that's just using PCA, but my favorite is if I go over here and use this nonlinear manifold generator. So it's trying to adaptively find um, a surface on that, that does a better job of clustering the individual digits next to each other. And sure enough, it's doing a pretty good job. Um, and so, it, so you can see that the, that the model has done a decent, if not perfect, job of separating the digits into regions in space that it can then classify, all right? But lots of great eye candy. And again, this is running on Anaconda Enterprise as a deployable app, okay? I'm really tempted to do this again, since I have the time. since I'm here. Okay, so there you go. So apparently I am a lobster. Um, oh no, actually I'm a bolo tie. Okay, so clearly they didn't do enough training on uh, charismatic consultants. So um, that's okay, that's okay. I'll live, um, my ego will be fine. 
<laughs> All right. So um, last little bit here. So we talk about uh, TensorFlow a la carte. Uh, earlier, in, earlier in the talk, I said that one of the, one of the you know, TensorFlow tries to be anything and everything in your machine learning pipeline. Um, and in particular, when I started to play with it, I started to use it, I was bothered by the fact that it seemed like I needed to use the data uh, API in particular to build my pipelines. But, you know, these were models that I'd already built for other purposes or on other platforms. And so I, you know, really struggled to, to, to accept that I, you know, I had to toss all that work out. Well, you really don't. Um, I want you to feel free to use the pieces of TensorFlow that work for you and not the pieces that, that you know, not reinvent the wheel when you don't have to. Um, and so fortunately, we can do that. And so what, we're wh what I've done is I've actually reproduced um, a wide and deep learning project that the Google uh, TensorFlow team has built. So they have a tutorial on this. The idea, uh, and I'll, I'll explain what wide and deep learning is a little bit, but the purpose of the model is to take the well-known census income data set and try to predict whether a household has an income of greater than 50K or less than or equal to 50K based on other features in the data set. And so what I wanted to do is I wanted to reproduce this tutorial on Anaconda Enterprise, but I didn't want to use their code. I wanted to get the results, but I, I wa didn't want to use their code. And in particular, I wanted to use the tools that I was already familiar with, Pandas and another uh, package called Intake that I'm about to talk about, um, in order to build the model and reproduce the same results, okay? And so that's what we're doing here. Um, now, what is wide and deep learning? I, this is a really fascinating topic to me in particular. Um, so you hear all the hype about deep learning, um, and you kind of think, well, what about all those classical machine learning methods like linear regression, logistic regression, and so forth? Do they still have a place? And I think the, the consensus is, yes, they still do. I mean, there's certain things that generalized linear models still do well. Um, in particular, if you already know the features that you need to use, uh, whether through experimentation or intuition or a little combination of both, um, then you, uh, and, uh, you've already applied the nonlinearities you want to apply, then, then with, a, with, a wi with a wide model or a generalized linear model, you can, you're going to be able to make the best use of that. Also, you can do, it's easier to do things like regularization and feature selection if you want to be aggressive about pruning the features that you use. And so th there's a certain aspect of memorization, if you will, kind of in ca uh, basically uh, uh, sort of making persistent your knowledge about the model um, with, uh, with wide learning or traditional statistical learning methods that you don't necessarily get with deep learning. On the other hand, I mean, what are the advantages of deep learning? I mean, you, you, in a way, deep, lear deep learning models can do their own feature engineering. They're going to discover correlations that, you, that may not have occurred to you, all right? They're going to find uh, opportunities for classification that you may not have explored. But at the same time, sometimes they'll miss the obvious choices. And so in, in a recommender system context in particular, sometimes it's really advantageous to combine the best aspects of a memorized set of features with the discovery and, uh, and adaptive aspects of a machine learning, of a deep learning model together. And so what the Google team, what the, what the researchers behind this wide deep learning project decided to do was combine the best of both worlds and have a wide model and a deep model together, trained together on the training data. And that's the important part. It's not just a matter of taking two separate models and picking the best results from both. They're actually feeding the data to the both models at the same time and building a combined error function to minimize the error across all both the wide and deep section of the model. Okay? I thought that was a really compelling idea. And they have used it to good effect in some of their recommender system designs. So I wanted to replicate that tutorial just for my own edification. Now I'm using, I, as, I, I, as I mentioned, I'm, I want to use pandas to do my data you know, intake and my data manipulation. And it turns out that TensorFlow understands that not everybody wants to use the data pipeline and they make it relatively easy to do that. But I also wanted to put a plug in for a brand new project that we're working on at Anaconda. It's going to be a, it's a totally free open source package called Intake. It's a set, it's a Python API for bulk, bulk data loading uh, with a variety of different formats. It's got a plug-in architecture, so it's easy to extend to new data sources, um, both remote and local. 
it will load the data directly into pandas data frames or numpy arrays or dask uh, or daskified versions of the same so uh, so it's compatible with those distributed data structures what i like about it um, is its ability to, to, to help you define what we might call data packages. So these are conda packages that you might think normally go with, or normally used for code, or actually, you, you actually use intake to define as a conda package an access to a particular data set. So if, you're, if your data needs to be versioned, so if you have different versions of your data, maybe it's the official modeling sample for a particular model you're using that evolves over time as your, as your historical database grows, then the, the Intake allows you to define these versioned and governed model data packages. So uh, it's a really attractive kind of concept for me, you know, in my work, and I wanted to use it for the sake of dogfooding it and for the sake of demonstrating it in this project. So using TensorFlow with pandas requires two important steps. All right, so first of all, TensorFlow, wh when you're describing a model to TensorFlow, one of the things you need to describe is what TensorFlow would call a column set. Um, and so it's, it's, ba it's a set from, from a pandas perspective. Each pandas series is a column in this column set, and you need to describe to TensorFlow what type it is. Now, of course, pandas has the notion of data type, right? I mean, we have numerical floating point columns and integer columns and string columns, which in this context are likely categorical. But, uh, but TensorFlow has its own notion of, of how to define what a column is, and so you need to tell it uh, whether it's a numerical, maybe you need to bucket that column, for instance. If it's an age, it's a, if it's an age variable, for instance, you might need to bucket it into groups of five years or so. If it's a categorical string column, there's a couple of different ways to describe it. So for example, you can take a single column in pandas and you need to translate it to a, what's called an indicator column, which is actually one column for each possible value of the indicator variable, a true false column in each case. And so for each row of your data, exactly one value across that indicator column set is true. Uh, another way to do it is what's called an embedding column. I don't know if anyone here is familiar with word embeddings, but in this case, it replaces each word, each categorical value with a floating point vector um, that is actually itself trained to provide good separation between, um, between the values. And so there's a, those are two different ways, and you have to specify, you actually have to tell TensorFlow what kind of column you want to treat that as as you go through. Um, and then once you've done that, it's actually pretty easy to provide the data itself into TensorFlow using the pandas input function um, uh, function in, in TensorFlow. And so here's an example of what that looks like. So in this particular data set, I'm going to get to the live demo here in just a second, but I wanted to s show this on the screen in bigger type just to explain that my data set has an income bracket column in the training data, obviously. Okay, And so what I need to do is I need to drop that uh, because obviously I w that's what I w exactly what I want to classify, I want to learn. Um, but the, my t for my training data, I actually want to replace it with, you know, a Boolean value, true, false. And so then I feed the pandas input function the data frame of the training data and then a, data f and then a series of the data that I'm trying, the, the, the quantity I'm trying to learn. And they both have to have the same index that's actually enforced by this input function. Um, and then you specify the batch size and the number of epochs, the number of times the learning algorithm is going to go through your data frame at each training step, okay? And then whether to shuffle that data or randomize it in that process. And then, of course, you specify the target column, okay? And this actually returns a function. So it's a closure. It returns a function that then TensorFlow uses to grab that data as it needs it. And so it's really not that hard uh, to, to do this step of it. The, set, the harder part is actually um, specifying the column set. So let's pop over to that package, or to that project. And let's see. We'll open up the file. And so this is a notebook that I have built. So refresh. Do that again. OK, good. OK, so let's see what I can do here. To expand this out. Actually, I may just have to do this. Okay, so um, just a couple of, here's a quick note about intake. Intake makes it really easy to, you know, load this data into, mem I mean into memory directly. And the way it works is actually you specify the format of your data in the, in the form of a YAML file. Okay, so this data set is actually somewhat, uh, uh, somewhat finicky. 
because unlike a typical CSV input, uh, it doesn't have any column headers, so you have to supply them yourself. And it, furthermore, in the test data set, there's not really a, there is a sort of a header, but it really doesn't describe, it doesn't actually list the column names, it's just a sort of a title of some sort. So I simply have to drop it um, and then replace it with my own column headers. And so my YAML file provides enough description um, in fact, it's actually letting me specify the keyword arguments to, p to the pandas read CSV function itself um, so that I can replace the column names. I can tell that there's no header. Here's the URL, so it's actually going to download it directly from the Internet. Um, and then the same with the test data set, only in this case I'm going to skip that first row because the data is, um, you know, because that header file is, that header isn't useful to me. Okay? So that's how intake helps you, lets you describe data sources, and you could build entire catalogs of data sources that you can navigate through. And that's what I've done in cell two here, is I've actually said, you know, pull the catalog from that particular YAML file. And I, and I actually needed the data frames in memory, so I just iterated through the catalog and I pulled them in, okay? And so then I could look and see what the data looks like. And so again, um, you know, I, I've got all of the, the, doc the demographic variables, and then finally what I'm going to predict is this income bracket right here. Um, there's a little bit of data cleaning, by the way, because if you look, there's periods at the end of the income bracket over here and not over here. So I had to be a little careful in my input function on how to handle that, no problem. So, th so anyway, really quick, a really quick way to get that data in. So now um, I need to describe those column sets to TensorFlow. And one of the nice things about pandas, of course, is that I can just iterate through the columns, look at the data type, and I can just algorithmically build the right kinds of column descriptors, TensorFlow column descriptors, that I need. And so that's what I've done here. Um, and in fact, um, I, I was a bit uh, uh, liberal about this in the sense I'm not actually using every single one of the columns, but I went ahead and I went through and I built the basic column descriptors for every column anyway. And I figure this is probably something that I can encapsulate in a function, you know, in my own kind of toolkit when I'm using pandas and, and TensorFlow together. It's just kind of automatically classify or automatically categorize my column sets. And so basically if I see an object column, I'm assuming it's a categorical. And so I give it the categorical list from, by dropping the duplicate, you know, by looking at the unique values of the strings in that column. And then, uh, and then I've generated both an, an indicator column and an embedding column for that particular column and just gave it a suffix so I could easily distinguish between the two. And now later on when I'm just playing, I can try different combinations of features in my model. Those column sets are already built for me. I don't have to do this anymore. Okay, so I do it once and I forget it while I iterate on building different kinds of models. Now, uh, there are some additional columns that I want, now I, there's some additional feature engineering I want to do here. I mentioned the possibility of bucketing. For age, I wanted to define a set of boundaries. So uh, th again, I'm, I'm, I am reproducing what they did in the, in the tutorial, so it's not like I invented this particular set of features. But uh, So I can use the bucketized column capability to do that. So I pulled in the age column and gave it the buckets. There's also the notion of crossed columns, right? So we want to be able to detect whether or not we, we, we want to feed as an input um, a separate column that represents the cross product of multiple columns. And I'm doing that here uh, for education and occupation. And then here's, a, here's another cross product of three different columns. So a pretty common practice when building wide models, right? I mean, this is the kind, these are the kinds of correlations actually that deep learning can tend to discover on its own. With wide learning, with generalized linear models, you have to do yourself, right? Um, and and if, you, if you're not careful about that, if you're too liberal about it, you're in danger of overfitting. So if you do it in a real promiscuous fashion, you need to make sure to do some sort of regularization or some sort of, st some sort of statistical test to determine which of your features are the most relevant to the model. So again, something that, you know, it's just, it's just general, pra you know, general strategies for building the right sets of features for your model. All right, so now it's time for action. We need to feed the data to TensorFlow. I define my input function. Now I shared the I shared on a previous slide what this looked like. The only difference here was that, as I pointed out, my categoricals for input income bucket were slightly different between the training data and the test data. So instead of just comparing to see if the string was equal to 50K or greater than or equal to 50K, I'm just looking for the presence of the greater than sign, um, and that worked just fine. And uh, then I drop the income bucket column because I don't want TensorFlow to have the very variable that it's trying to learn. Um, and actually, TensorFlow will complain if you do that. So that's good modeling practice. I very much appreciate that sanity check. Um, and then I'm passing it in. 
And so now let's look at the wide model. So I'm using the standard TensorFlow linear classifier although it's, uh, for this. Um, I'm using a, a specific set of columns, including my bucketed AH column and those two cross product columns that I generated earlier. And I pass them in um, to the linear classifier and build a model from that. And then I train it. And when I train it, we're getting an accuracy of 83.7% after 40 epochs. In other words, 40 passes through the training data. I get 83% accuracy. Not too bad. And, I mean, full disclosure, this is, this is a demo model. Um, they, you know, for the applications that they've used, they've got significantly better performance for wide and deep. But, um, but nevertheless, that's not too bad. Now for the deep model, uh, we're using, you know, I mentioned earlier that uh, we're using uh, uh, that Keras is now becoming a, 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 a very uh, popular way to build deep learning models in TensorFlow. I'm not doing that here. This is the tutorial didn't do that here. I'm using the original uh, deep learning API that TensorFlow provided, um, which is in this particular case, it's not too difficult to use because this is a sequential network. It has, it's a, you know, it's, it's got a pretty simple layer structure. I just specify the number of hidden units at, in each layer. So there's really not a lot of complexity in this particular model. So the TensorFlow's, TensorFlow's built-in API is plenty convenient for me here. In this case, I'm not using any of those cross-product columns, uh, and I, but I am using indicator columns and a, an, an embedding column for the occupation uh, categorical. All right, um, and then I just, I specify those columns to the deep learning model, build the deep model, and then I train that. And after 40 epochs, I get an accuracy of only 82%. So here's a great example where, per, you know, after obviously some manual feature, feature engineering, I'm able to get a generalized linear model that is doing better, if you will, on this data than the deep learning model. But now I get to combine it together. And remember, what we're not talking, we're not talking about just taking the two models and training them separately and then letting them kind of compete with each other. We are actually training them together as a single entity. And so, you know, again, you know, Google makes that, Google provides the ability to build this wide and deep model for you with a DNN linear combined classifier method. And so you provide, you supply the uh, wide columns and the deep columns separately. And then you specify the, the same, you know, s we're going to specify the same hidden layer structure as we did in the deep case. And then we can train that. And when we're done with that, we get a performance of 84%. So we've done better by combining the wide and deep. We did better than we did with either of them separately. And I mean, that was fascinating. I mean, personally, that was fascinating to me as just a, you know, as the, as the fellow nerd. And it was great to be able to reproduce the same results that they were seeing in their demo without having to use a tf.data API. Um, and so, uh, so anyway, that's the demo for, I mean, that's, that's the wide and deep demonstration. You can have this, by the way, um, if you want to. Um, if you go to my, my channel on Anaconda Cloud, I've put the Wide and Deep project right here. You can download this, and you can run it on your laptop. Um, it uses the Anaconda project capability. So the download it onto your laptop. Do uh, make sure that Anaconda project run. I mean, Anaconda project rather is installed in your root environment alongside Conda, and then go into this directory and do Anaconda project run. It will instantiate a TensorFlow environment for you, and it will uh, it will fire up the notebook. All right, and. If you want to, uh, and we're going to talk in just a second, if you have an Anaconda Enterprise installation or if you get one, upload this to Anaconda Enterprise and do it yourself and run this yourself, okay? So next steps. First of all, uh, I really would encourage you to learn more about Anaconda Enterprise. Um, it's one of the reasons why we're here is obviously to share with you the great things that we're doing at Anaconda. Uh, but I think for uh, a lot of our customers, I mean, a lot of the folks at this, in this conference, a lot of the folks that are coming by here, Anaconda Enterprise has a lot to offer you. Um, and, you'll and you'll be hearing more about it over the course of, of, uh, of this conference. Uh, if you are interested, we have a 30-day test drive available that, in fact, I'm, I'm running right now as part of this uh, as part of this talk, uh, you can you can be up and running with a with with an instance of Anaconda Enterprise on the Google Cloud platform in a matter of minutes, uh, and they'll send you your login information, and you you're free to to use it uh, for 30 days. And it's a great way to try these things out. You can try out the sample projects. You can uh, 
uh, you can, again, r run my wide and deep demo if you'd like to. I've got a portfolio modeling demo up on there as well that's in project form that you can try out. Uh, and so I encourage you, if, if you're interested in Anaconda Enterprise, this is one great way to get started. Um, and other than that, I look forward to talking with any of you uh, over the course of the conference. Thank you for your time.